Next in the den. Product designers and camping enthusiasts, Jonathan Harris and Jonathan Schofield. I was a Cub Scout. My dad was in the army, so I've had it throughout my uh, upbringing. And to actually create a product from scratch uh, in this marketplace is, is fantastic. They certainly know which dragon they want and why they want her. Well, I think Deborah Meadham would be a really exciting uh, dragon to have on board for us. Um, obviously, with her knowledge of the camping and uh, recreational vehicle market, we feel that would be a brilliant opportunity and probably could bring other uh, angles to the project as well. Hello, dragons. My name's Jonathan Harrison. This is the Opus Camper the world's most exciting mobile glamping product. We are looking for uh, an 80,000 pound investment for 5% in this startup company. My name is Jonathan Schofield, and I'd like to take you through the features and benefits of the Opus Camper. So the Opus Camper is a fully braked trailer. It's designed to take boats, bikes, um, kayaks, and even a motorbike and it's designed when you actually get to your end destination, you can remove all your outdoor adventure toys, then the Opus trailer becomes the Opus camper. Inside, you'll find it's got two king-size beds at either end. It's got running water, it's got heating, it's got gas and electric cooking, it's got a refrigerator in there as well, and even a toilet. Uh, we would really like to have investment from a high-profile dragon raise the brand awareness um, and really m hopefully turn our dreams of, of selling 500 units a reality within the coming years. And we'd really like to invite ye dragons to come up and have a look inside. Part caravan, part trailer and part tent. It's a wholly original offering from Jonathan Harrison and Jonathan Schofield. Oh, gosh, that's actually amazing. They're seeking £80,000 in return for a 5% stake in wow. their new camper company. <laughs> it looks yes, no, like all of, all of it, it. this would take me a week to turn into a I don't tent think, I don't from think, the trailer. I, I think you'd have to assemble this. But a quick look around the product has left Sarah Willingham reaching for the instruction manual. How long does that take to change that into that and Chance. how many people does it take? It can be done by one person because the process is only opening both the panels like that so it opens a bit like a silver cross pram and then you wind the corner legs down either side and the bed supports and then you're inside um, so it takes about 20, 20 minutes. So, so a numpty like me could put that up for in, in 20 minutes? Yeah. Even the inside? So yeah, I mean it's all very I mean, it's very easy, you're just lifting things into position. It's not sort of a jigsaw type of puzzle. Wow, and all the top and everything. Yeah, that's all fixed into position, yeah. I don't think I've ever been into a tent or a caravan without hitting my head. We did have you in mind with this. No, it's the first time I've ever walked in and thought, wow, I don't have to duck. Big thing for me was the toilet inside. Because if you pit imagine at night and you want to go up for a number two, and you've got a full house. It's going to be quite embarrassing. <laughs> so how, how can you sort of deal with that? Because that's the only thing that's kind of putting me off. There's an awning, which is like an, an extra tent, which can go on the front, which kind of gives you like a lobby area. And to, to the side of that, you can have a little pod, which is a closed off area, and you can put the toilet there. I can't believe you actually go to the toilet, Peter. I had absolutely no idea. Well, it doesn't smell, my <laughs> poo. <laughs> <laughs> Despite Peter Jones's attempt to poo-poo their product, the entrepreneurs are still smelling of roses. But it is established leisure industry player Deborah Meaden who the pair are really looking to impress. So, um, what's the what's the closest equivalent that you have on this at the moment? Because I have seen some trailers with pop-up 
top. A lot of these things are um, things from the 70s and 80s. And some of the ones you probably see out there now are probably ones which are still being used. So we wanted to give it a really modern feel and think, well, what can we change about it? And what we've done, which is different, is we've kind of put the curves in it and raised the ceiling, you know, to give you the advantage of being canvas. And what's the market doing? I mean, where have you, where have you shown? You must have been to the caravan show. What happened? We kind of find that if someone's except a caravan, they're probably not going to have this product. So it kind of tends to be people who go, Actually, I would never be in the market for a caravan. Yeah, I'd have a VW camper, yeah. that's kind of cool, but a VW camper, which is going to cost 40 to 50,000 pounds, and this being kind of the, the 12,000 pound mark is much more affordable. The camping and caravanning entrepreneurs and their dragon of choice appear to be speaking the same language. And Sarah Willingham is curious about the individuals behind the innovation. What, what made you do this? Are you just good campers or have you been in the industry? We've been in the industry uh, making accessories for the caravan market since uh, uh, 2002. Purple Line is the, is the uh, foundation company. Jonathan's got that business. Tell us about the existing business. What does that turn over? What does it, how's it going? Um, the latest accounts, uh, we did a three uh, I think it was 3.4 million turnover. Uh, made a profit of um, just shy of 500,000. And it's a wholesale business. So we're looking to hive off this retail um, business of the Opus Camper. Why don't you just keep it in the existing business? 80 grand for 5% all in? <laughs> Uh, you might, for, you for might the have Opus five camper, very yeah. interested dragons on that <laughs> for the, Opus, the Opus Camper, that's what we're, we're presenting to you today. I'm not looking for investment into uh, the Purple Line business. It's bad news for the deal-hungry dragons as Jonathan places his existing business out of bounds. And the relationship between the old and new parts of his empire is puzzling to Suleiman. I have a bit of manufacturing background. Oh, are we saying that Purple Line going forward will manufacture them and Opus will buy them from Purple Line or will Opus be a manu manufacturer? I don't quite get it. No, I think Opus will be the manufacturer. This is the, the, the business model we're doing with uh, Australia and America as well. I've got a sister company, one in Australia and one in California. They tap into uh, our CAD engineering expertise, uh, our marketing, graphic design. They're smaller operations, and that's working well. Can I just clarify? You've got a business doing this in Australia and America, so, th so we can only really be in the UK? Yes. So this is effectively sort of a UK distributorship of an idea? Without any... That's it, isn't it? UK distributor. Uh, that's effective, it is, because if, if we're not allowed yeah. to sell these things in Australia and yeah. America, where there is a big market, because you're mm. already doing that, mm. you're, you're, you're giving us a chance, thank you very much, yeah. to be a salesman in your, in your distributorship in the UK. Well, look, I mean, one of the reasons I came onto this show, I quite enjoy working with people who have had an idea and they want to make it come to reality and they need a bit of help to, to, to come along and do that, and you can see their dreams come true. But I didn't come on the show to become a salesman for someone's minor subsidiary. I'm out. With only a slice of the domestic camper market up for grabs, a disgruntled Nick Jenkins has turned down the deal. Will Sarah Willingham prove any more open to investing on those terms? I personally find it very difficult to get very excited and work very hard on the UK market, knowing you're opening up lots of other doors of which I would never be part of. But I really like it and I can completely see who your market is. I'd like to make you an offer. I'd like to offer you all of the money for 10% of your existing business, but as soon as we hit 200 units, you can buy back half of my shareholding, taking me down to 5% at the same price as I invest in today. Sarah Willingham is first to test the water. She's offered the full £80,000, 
but in return, she wants a slice of Jonathan's lucrative camping accessory company. With the poker-faced entrepreneur giving nothing away, it's time for Peter Jones to chance his hand. I'm, I was sitting here really excited about the opportunity, and it's kind of... it's falling apart, really, because whilst the product is amazing, everything filters back to Purple Line. It's a bit like you're the honeypot. I just don't want to be the one that's stung. So, Jonathan, I'm going to give you an issue to think about. I'm going to make you an offer. I'm going to offer you all of the money, but I want 10% of Purple Line. Two dragons are now in, but only on condition that Jonathan folds his existing business into the deal. Will clothing magnate Tuka Suleiman follow suit? OK, so, guys, I'm going to make you an offer. I will give you all of the money for 10% of Purple Line or all of the money for 25% of Opus. A dual offer for the pair to consider. Tuka Suleiman's willingness to invest in just the camper business, putting him in pole position to snap up the deal. But one dragon is still to play, and with her background in the camping and caravanning industry, she could hold all the cards. I, you have made it very difficult because, um, actually, uh, when you talked about the global reach, that was the bit that started getting quite exciting. And I thought, actually, it's the UK and Europe, and that's quite different. But I do like it. So I'm going to make you an offer for all of the money, but I want 25% of the business. And I'm being clear, it's about the Opus business. Um... So for the two entrepreneurs, a difficult decision. I like Sarah's offer. Do you? I like Deborah's offer. Deborah's going to bring the most to the party. Or, with their preferred dragon confining her offer to their new business, perhaps for once it's a straightforward one. That was a bit too quick. Was it? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no disrespect to any of you guys, but there was obviously one dragon we kind of felt would be really good for the business. Well, just before you say oh. that, can I make you another offer then? Yeah. Because <laughs> you're clearly going for Deborah, <laughs> which really, really hacks me off. <laughs> and it's not right. What do you mean it's not right? <laughs> Spot on. <laughs> I would be willing to halve my purple line 10% with Deborah, so that I would own 5%. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, yeah, thank you, all, all dragons. Yeah, um, you know, prior to coming in, we, we were definitely hoping to court one particular dragon. Um, we would love to go ahead and, and work alongside you, Deborah. Great nice job. Show <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Well, how much fun, eh? It's going to be festivals. Yeah, so I'm going to spend my summer <laughs> doing festivals. <laughs> Marvellous. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. So two very happy campers leave the den. Mind the trapdoor. Having succeeded in securing the dragon investor of their choice. <sighs> Not to mention a substantial £80,000 cash injection. It's the turbo charge that we really wanted for the business to really take us to the next level. Well, the way I look at it, I didn't lose. I didn't want that deal anyway. I did. <laughs> <laughs> no, not smarting well, at well all, Well done, Peter. Deborah. Not well, well at all. Done. To um, team up with Deborah is, is fantastic news for us and yeah. uh, will really give uh, all the team uh, great encouragement moving forward. Hello, I'm Christian van Outersterp. 
and I'm Carolyn Van Outersterp and our business is Jolly Days Luxury Camping. We want to take this business further, faster, so we're here to ask for £200,000 in exchange for 20% of our business. Jolly Days is a multi-award winning business established four and a half years ago and has revolutionised UK glamping. We currently have one tented camp of 22 accommodation units in a beautiful 200 acre woodland close to York. Our huge vintage style tents have four poster beds, roll top baths, ensuite showers, kitchens and wood burners. We currently operate nine months of the year and have been profitable since day one. To expand the business, we have obtained planning permission for 50 wooden accommodation suites in a 400 acre woodland in the Yorkshire Wolds. This will operate 12 months of the year and will centre around a luxurious clubhouse where you'll be able to eat delicious local food or curl up with a hot toddy in front of the fire. The 50 private woodland suites are more akin to a luxurious hotel suite in the woods and will feature wood burners, four poster beds and spacious spa style bathrooms. Our short term aim is to have 100 accommodation units over two camps generating 4 million profit. This is a winning proposition and one of the UK's most exciting new hospitality ventures. And we'd love you to be involved. Thank you. A practised pitch from these glamping entrepreneurs from York. They're asking for £200,000 for 20% of an established business they want to expand. And with Deborah Meaden having made millions running a holiday business, the Den will be keen to hear her thoughts first. I like this, you know, it's just, it interests me. And not surprisingly, I've been in this industry and I watch it very carefully. I know of you. And I also know of the many other businesses that have sprung up individually, because that's proliferated, yeah. hasn't it? Glamping's absolutely been the latest thing for people to, yeah. to get into. So my only question on that would be, what's occupancy doing in terms of glamping? So how long have you been running? Four and a half years. And last year, how was your occupancy compared to the year before? It was 57%, and I think we grew by about 20%. You grew? Yes. yes. So far, so good for the entrepreneurs. But are their revenue figures as healthy as the number of tents they're filling? The turnover of the business to date? Last year was 365 net and uh, 102,000 net profit. Ted, talk me through how you get to four million pounds profit post a 200,000 pound investment. What we're looking to do is a 200,000 pound investment and bank loan and set up the clubhouse and 15. What's the bank, bank loan? Bank loan's 300,000. So it's. So the key thing is what's the total cost of doing this new venture? For stage one, it, we're saying ha half a million for the clubhouse and 15 units, and thereafter it's generating cash to, to grow. Have you bought the land? No, we lease, lease it, it off an estate. For how long? 15 years with a three year option on top of that. 15 years? Yeah. That's not very long, is it? In what way have you protected the business from the landlord saying, thank you very much, Christian Carolyn? You've now invested £3 million. You've had a good run at it. You've made a little bit of money, but I'm now taking it back and I'm going to run it as my own business. Well, How there wouldn't be you... anything there for him to run because we don't own everything. Because you own everything? It you would go... revert back to just woodland if we, if we went. So you've now got to go in and clear the site? Yes, that would, that would be... That's devastating. It would be. a game-changing piece of information in what to date had been a convincing pitch. And Duncan Bannatyne is not ready to let it lie. Who decided on 15 years? I think the land agent of the estate. I think we push for more, but for some reason mm. they're slightly... Yeah, because I think tenants have more rights. Why didn't you negotiate a 40-year lease with a 15-year tenant-only break? Yeah, I mean, I think the reality of it is that the two landowners that we work with are both estate landowners. Is it a very well-known estate? No. It's a family owned. Yeah. It's a family, yeah, they're both, they're both family, family sort of local poshy landowners that own And land. it's been in the family for a long time? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, I've rented off the Blenheim estate. You know, when, when you rent off a family and it's been in a family for a long time, it's always going to be in that family. And I would think it would be unlikely that they would rent, rent you the land for 40 years. So, so couldn't you just lift your model into some land you can buy? Is, there, is it something particular about these woods? Yeah, I suppose, it, yeah, I mean, the woods most, are most, of the, most of the beautiful <laughs> woods are, are, are on, are on think, sort of landed estates and, and they're and not also, going to sell. I mean, our woodland is not plantation woodland. It is beautiful, natural English woodland. So it's about that kind of aspect of uh, something that is magical and is romantic and it's incredibly well placed. And this site is between York and Beverley. So it's a very well placed in terms of tourism. It's a sort of tourism hotspot, really. The entrepreneurs are hanging on by their fingertips. So is Duncan Bannatyne ready to give them a lifeline? I've just bought a lodge in a park in, in the banks of Lake Windermere, which I love. I spend all my time there. And I think it's fantastic, uh, the concept that you have at the moment. It's almost worth investing £200,000 in your business as it is, because you're, you're doing very well, you're making a lot of money. But that's not what you want. you want. You want to go ahead with this. And I think you know there is a huge risk because you don't own the land. And the fact that you can get kicked off for 15 years worries me too much. So I can't make an investment. Otherwise, I'd have loved to. So I'm sorry, but I have to say I'm out. A blow for Christian and Caroline as their first dragon bows out on account of what could be a fatal flaw in their expansion plan the thorny issue of the 15-year lease. Has it convinced the other dragons to walk away from a deal? As you approach the end of your lease and you want to sell the business, the buyer is going to have to negotiate a new lease with the landlord and your negotiating position will just evaporate and so will the value of your business. So I think, for me, because of that one issue, really, it wouldn't work, so... Fantastic, well done, but I'm afraid I'm out. Guys, um, I do think you have an issue that you don't own the land. I think that your business plan is flawed. I think you should retreat and think about what you've, what you've got and make that better. And as everybody said, when it comes to the end of 15 years, you actually don't own anything and you've spent millions of pounds. So I wish you luck, but I'm afraid I'm out. I would urge you not even to contemplate doing this project at all. It's flawed. You always end up over budget. You always end up under-resourcing, and you always end up with a position where this occupancy rate doesn't quite happen. And one or two bad seasons, and all of a sudden, you're chasing your tail. I can't invest in something that is whimsical. So, clearly, you know where I'm going. I won't be investing, and I'm out. Only one dragon left. Will Deborah Meaden, with her experience in this field, be any more willing to offer the entrepreneurs the cash to make their expansion dreams a reality? I intrinsically understand this end of the market. I used to find people choose to camp or even stay in caravans, not just because of money, not just because of price, but because it's different and it's fun. They've chosen that. You've got that in the glamping model. You lose something in the romance of it when you turn it into a hotel with lots of rooms all over it. So I won't be investing and I'm out. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good, luck. Good luck. A disappointed Christian and Caroline exit the den. They needed an investment to transform their successful glamping business, but they leave with nothing. Back to Milo. Renegotiate. That's a shame. I got my Volkswagen camper van, Ruby, and I love it. I love this. I'd, I'd go. My 40th birthday had quite a big effect on me, realistically. It was the, a wake-up call where you realised that you're at a point in your life where if you're going to make a difference and do something, it kind of needs to be now. 
I became an entrepreneur because I found that there's many products on the market that I could re-engineer, redesign, that could make them more efficient and better. Hello, my name is Spencer Turner and I'm here today looking for a £45,000 investment for a 25% share in my company, Tagology. Uh, Tag stove is the most efficient portable gas camping stove ever made. It runs on cost-effective butane and utilises a thermoelectric generator to produce electrical current for charging mobile phones, GPS, GoPro cameras and many other devices that charge using a standard USB connection. Uh, I'm the, the stove will retail at £149, and we're looking to retail it into a number of existing markets, including camping, fishing, and festivals. Um, pressure. Um, in the UK alone, there's over 1.2 million people that go camping on average every year, and fishing is the largest industry in the world, valued at over £1.5 billion. I have a number of... Um, uh, uh, I have a number of letters of intent from both Go Outdoors and from Total Fishing Tackle. I'm looking to have a dragon on board to help get the product into the retail market and the larger distribution networks. Thank you for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. A camping stove with a 21st century twist is the offering from Spencer Turner, who's looking for £45,000 in return for a 25% stake in his business. Peter Jones is quick to pick up on the entrepreneur's faltering delivery. You're nervous, Spencer. Yes, yeah, sorry, yes, I am, yes. If you're, not, you're not used to pitching to people? No, not at all, no. Can you demonstrate the product? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so essentially what's happening here is, is a, a relatively simple process. Um, the, the gas flame produces around 1,200 degrees, and what we're doing is we're transferring part of that heat to what's called a thermoelectric generator. And essentially what happens is, is it creates electrical current, which then you can use for charging mobile devices. Spencer, you're focusing very heavily on the fact that this is a charger. So is your pitch not the fact that it's a sort of a fire burner or a stove, but it has a capacity to charge phones? It's very much so, first and foremost, a camping stove. That was the, uh, the concept originally, that's where the product came from. Uh, we've been camping, we go camping quite a lot, and I found a frustration with the gases that are available. If I can, I'll, I'll show you this. This is a very standard camping gas cylinder, it's filled with butane. The problem with these are is that you end up with no pressure for cooking. So the actual gas fails and you can't cook with it. So to get around that, what industry has done is they have come up with what's called a mixed gas solution. And it's essentially, these hold the same amount of fuel as these. But because these gases cost £4.50 for this cylinder, whereas this one costs £1.50 and cheaper than that. So your stove makes use of the lower cost butane bottle. It does. But provides a better heat source and can charge products that you want to plug in. The fact that it creates current is almost a byproduct of what I was trying to overcome. An innovative product with a clearly defined market always ignites the dragon's interest and established leisure industry player Deborah Meaden is keen to find out more about Spencer's competition. Can you describe the other stoves that are available? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and, and the price points. Yeah, OK, the, the other stove that uses a thermoelectric generator that produces electrical current is called the BioLite. That retails between 129 and 149 pounds. Uh, that doesn't use gas, it runs on sticks, effectively. So it's a, a fuel chamber that you light a fire and it produces electrical current so you can charge from it. OK, so, um, so what that has, there is a bit of a romance to the fire. When you can, you, you're a camper, you know that. Yeah. So, so it, you're kind of that, that. That's the slightly more romantic side of it. So you still light your fire. It's still you know the, the combination yeah. of the, the fire there. But this is the more um, efficient 
way of it doing it. So if I was going to choose between them, my decision would be, do I still want to like the sticks or do I actually want to use the... I think the bar light is a great concept. The unfortunate reality is, is the output that it produces is very low, but also there's a majority of places where you go camping, you're not you allowed to use allowed, them. Well, you yeah. couldn't on our sites. I've, I've got to tell you, I like it. It's great, thank you. It's very rare that in my first opening set of questions, I get to the conclusion that it's something that I want to get involved with, but that just happened to me. Oh, it's great. It's good to hear. Thank you. You have come in with a good product, um, so I'm going to make you an offer on the terms that you have come in for. All of the money, 25% of the business. Thank you very much. Thank you. A clearly impressed Deborah Meaden has gone straight in with an offer. The full £45,000 and, unusually, for no more than the 25% equity that Spencer was originally looking to give away. And now Sarah Willingham also looks keen. I think you've created something really brilliant. I really do. Thank you. It looks really nice. I'm really happy to take it out outside our bell tent and, and work it. My problem with it as an investment for me is I don't really get the mechanics of it. And so I feel I couldn't sit there and talk about it um, and do it justice. So for that reason, um, I'm going to say that I'm not going to invest in it. So good luck with everything, but I'm very sorry I'm out. OK, thank you very much. High praise for the product, but a failure to win any cash from Sarah Willingham. Will fashion tycoon Tuka Suleiman want to add a camping stove to his business portfolio? It just so happens that um, I've just taken on an industrial engineer and we're, we're about to develop accessories, bags and whatever, which is a power pack and you can charge your phone three times a day. Is there a way that you could add power packs on top of your charger. So you take the power pack away, you've got a power pack that's already recharged. Yes, that was an avenue that we looked down. And when we spoke to the manufacturers, one of the reasons why we didn't do that was because having a power pack that disconnected would create more connection points. And what we're actually designing at the moment is something that would make the power pack and the charging system waterproof. It means I'd love to would... put you and my girl together. Because together, you guys make a great team. I like it. Thank you. It complements what I'm doing, and I'll think about it. No offer from Tuka Suleiman, but his interest has clearly been engaged, prompting telecom's giant Peter Jones to make a very direct inquiry. Who do you like out of the five of us? That's a very harsh question. <laughs> Um, I, I, I have to say that, um, that, that you know, Deborah and Peter, I don't mean any disrespect to anybody else, but um, obviously with your background and obviously aware of your background, you're very much so in the right kind of position to be able to assist greatly to take this through to, uh, to, to, to market. Well, the reason why I ask that is because I was sitting here, I was interested at the get-go. Deborah was offered at the price that you came in at. And just my competitive nature, even if it was like 26%, I'd want to get a little bit more. But she's gone straight in at that level, and I can see why. I think it's, it is great. So I am going to make you an offer. But I'm going to give you the option of two offers, depending on what Deborah were to say. I'm going to make you an offer for all of the money, 45,000, for 25% as well. Or... 45,000 for 30% if it's split with Deborah. So half of the money, and at least I have 15% of the business. Um, can I ask, I have been to China, I have met with manufacturers, but because I've never taken anything to market before, actually getting a manufacturer to commit to actually get this project moving forward is becoming cumbersome. Is that something that you guys could assist with? Completely. What I would probably do is put you in touch with somebody who, who all the time deals with people. In fact, I know exactly... I'd put you in touch with Stuart. That's what I would okay. do. Okay, you number. <laughs> Stuart's very nice. You'll get on very well with Stuart. I currently have an innovation centre in, in Singapore, Hong Kong um, and in Taipei. From a 
mobile telecoms perspective, you probably know that about sort of, you know about 80 million dollars worth of product is developed, manufactured from our own plant. So all of that, I actually own that infrastructure. So yeah, and that's why I think you should choose me. Spencer has sparked a bidding war in the den as both Deborah Meaden and Peter Jones pitch to secure the deal. Is Nick Jenkins poised to open a fresh front in the battle? Well, Spencer, I, I was going to offer you half a million pounds for 5% of the company, but, but since you <laughs> already I've... said <laughs> yes. you didn't want yes. me uh, before, you, <laughs> yes. b b before I had the chance to make that offer, I think, I, I think, I think no, no I'm, going, I'm going to pull back from that one. Um, uh, I can see the glint in, um, in Deborah's eye on this one. Um, not, not, going to, not going to compete. But anyway, I wish you all the best of luck with okay, it. Thank um, you but I'm out. A rare show of deference as Nick Jenkins clears the way for his fellow dragon to secure the investment. Thinking time over, is Tuka Suleiman now ready to make his move? Spencer, I know about manufacturing. We have an office in China. I like it. Um, I, I believe that I have more time than any dragon here. I will fly to China with you and negotiate that deal. I don't believe the other two dragons will. And I believe that what you need is not just the odd phone call here, the odd phone call there. Sorry, can I just be absolutely clear, just in case you're inferring that that's how I do business? No, none of my investments get the odd telephone call here. Will you fly, to, will you fly the, to China with no, him? No, Stuart will fly to China oh, with him. OK, I will fly to you China with you. You have absolutely no idea how I okay. run my investments. I will make this happen and I will finance it beyond what I'm going to offer you because you're going to need money to, as working capital. So I'm going to make you an offer. I'm going to give you 60,000 for your 25%. Right, OK. <laughs> uh, that I didn't expect. Tuka Suleiman has offered 15,000 more than Spencer's 45,000 pound asking price in an 11th hour bid to clinch the deal. With four competing offers, including a proposal from Peter Jones to split the deal with Deborah Meaden, the ball is firmly in the entrepreneur's court. Thank you very much for your offer. Um, however, the, the, the fact that Deborah and Peter have got the background and experience already within this particular market unfortunately just makes them a, a, a much, in a much better, stronger position kind of thing. And so if Deborah was willing to and was happy to go down the same lines as Peter, I would be happy to do that. I've got a lot of investments for Peter, and um, I have to say on this one, because I can, I can see it. <laughs> I'm going to be really greedy. For me, this is one that I would like on my own. And that's why I, make, I, was, I suggested it, because I thought yeah. you'd have a chance of getting it, but now you probably won't. A surprising development as Deborah Meaden spurns an alliance with her fellow dragon. It's decision time for Spencer. Deborah, again, thank you very much for your offer. But if, Peter, if you're happy to do the same offer, then I'd prefer to take it from yourself. Yep. yep. Done. Done. Great. Well done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Great well done. Cheers, mate. Thank Great you. Pitch. Thank you. Brilliant. Well. No, no, even done. the nerves, everything. It's brilliant. Very okay. excited. Very well done. Thank you very much. Very well Thank done. you, guys. Thank you. Well, thanks, Spencer. Thank you. So, success for Spencer, who leaves the den with the £45,000 he was originally seeking and the backing of a dragon with the international clout to drive his invention to market. I'm, I'm obviously really excited and really happy to get Peter involved. He seems really positive about it as well. It is uh, more than I would hope for. 
I'm quite excited about that. I was surprised, though. I must admit, I thought he was going to go with you. I really did. Until you came in with your whole Hong Kong innovation yeah. thing, I was like, oh, oh here we go. Don't give me that. Everybody knows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you should have. Uh, you should have taken my offer, Deborah. <laughs> First to face the dragons are Lee Denny and Julia Le. Deep breath in, deep breath out. Go ahead. Every would-be scout knows the importance of being prepared. And Lee and Julia have spent a decade in muddy fields as groundwork for today. We'd both been working in festivals and music for 10 years, and we were trying to think of an entirely new experience that gave people the chance to come away with more than just a hangover. Oh, it looks great. Looks like my cup of tea, whatever it is. I'd love to do that. Unfortunately, having suffered a fractured wrist, Deborah Meaden will just have to park the pottery green for now. But that doesn't stop her from being the entrepreneur's favourite dragon. I would really like to work with Deborah Meaden. I'm hearing the music from Ghost. <laughs> what is it, Unchained <laughs> Melody? <laughs> just close your eyes and imagine, Deborah. <laughs> She's got a really great background in holiday camps and her ethics just seem really, really aligned with what we do. Hi, I'm Julia Lowe. And I'm Lee Denny. And we are the founders of Camp Wildfire, the UK's first summer camp for adults. We are offering a 5% stake in our business in return for a £75,000 investment. At Camp Wildfire, you adventure by day and you party by night. Your ticket includes a choice of over 100 activities and 50 bands and DJs. You'll spend your days driving quad bikes, firing arrows, climbing trees and building rafts. And as night falls, you'll feast on banquets, party in the forest and cosy up around campfires. This year, we have two sold-out events and are about to launch a third. We will turn over 1.8 million and anticipate net profits of 315,000. So we'd just like to say thank you to Matt, who's just showing you one of the examples of the kind of activities you can do at Camp Wildfire. We'd also like to thank Danny. We have a cocktail making workshop at the event. He's going to bring you a cocktail now. Summer Camps for Adults is the brainchild of Lee Denny and Julia Lowe. Everybody at Camp Wildfire gets given an enamel mug on the way in. Thank you very much. Uh, this is so we don't have to use any disposable plastics. They're seeking a £75,000 investment in return for 5% of their company. And it appears Sarah Davies is quite taken with the idea of daytime adventures and nighttime partying. Hey guys, this sounds <laughs> brilliant. I was actually going to ask you about your target market and the demographic that you're hitting. So m most people coming tend to be aged 30 to 45. It tends to be people that have been to a couple of festivals before. Now they want something a little bit more engaging. They want to go away, having learned some new skills and feeling really good about themselves. So what does it cost me for an individual ticket for the weekend? We have three different ticket prices. We have an elementary ticket, which is £245. Mm -hmm. That comes with 60 activity credits and all the kind of bands and DJs. A standard ticket, that's 295 and that comes with 120 activity credits. And then we have a dynamo version, which comes with unlimited activity credits. And last question from me, how do I book on have you still got any availability <laughs> this year? Yeah. We can sort you out. <laughs> An activity-packed weekend under canvas could be just the ticket for Sarah Davies. Deborah Meaden now wants to arm herself with the Dapper Duo's financials. I've never seen grown-ups look so good in their sky type bits, though. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so let's talk about some numbers. Do you want to take me through what you've already done, then? We were established in 2015. Between 2015 and 2019, we were making net losses of around 10 to 20,000 per year. That's normal for an event brand. It takes three, five years to, to get going and to get to that break-even point. Really excitingly for us, 2019, 2020 financial year, we'd sold out 2,000 tickets. Uh, we'd turned over 600,000, or would have turned over 600,000, and we would have made a 100,000 pound profit. 
Unfortunately, due to COVID, we weren't able to run our events that year. Uh, we've managed to come back stronger this year. We've already sold 1.3 million's worth of tickets and we should make 315,000 net profit. So what does the balance sheet look like? As of today, I don't know because we're still working out all the COVID losses. I know, I know it's been a really tough year. Yeah, because it's a tough year is the very year you should be on it. When it's tough and things are going wrong, you've got to be all over your numbers. Yeah. Some in-depth dragon delving reveals that the event planning pair have a shaky grasp of their current festival's finances. Now, Stephen Bartlett wants to find out more about the man and woman beneath the badges. What are your backgrounds? So my background is in graphic design. That's actually how Lee and I met. So Lee was running festivals for many years and I was his graphic designer. Yeah, um, I started my first festival business at the age of 16 in my back garden when my parents went away on holiday. And they said, you're not allowed to have a house party. So me and my friends had a festival instead. That festival ran for 10 years and was very successful. And you sold it or? It was actually run as a non-profit festival, so me and my friends started it primarily to support music in our local area, and then it just kind of kicked off. It grew to about 2,500 attendees over the course of 10 years, um, uh, but we were all working on it voluntarily, so it just kind of ran its course, uh, and then, then we closed down the company. We gave all the money to charity. Um, yeah, and how much was it? How much did you give? Sorry, uh, I think some years we made a loss, so we didn't actually end up uh, being able to give money to charity. Other years we gave four or five thousand pounds. So that was basically a, a festival and a business, but it didn't make any money and you just closed it? Well, I think because we couldn't get the ticket prices high enough um, to compete on lineup with a lot of the big guys. Whereas with this, this is completely unique, which is why people are willing to pay a premium ticket price for it. But the thing is, you haven't, you haven't done this yet, have you? We yes, have. We've, we've run it for five years. Yeah. In 2015 was our first event. So you've got five years to 19, and specifically on that year, how much net profit? Net loss, 10,000. OK, then you have the pandemic. Your hands are tied. Yep. And now this year, yes, you've taken people's money, mm -hmm. yep. but you still haven't run a festival, still haven't made money. So right up until now, you haven't demonstrated that you can run a festival and make money. Um, is that fair statement? I guess, yeah, that's a fair statement. I'm giving you a hard time because you've come in at a £1.5 million valuation just because you've sold tickets to an event you haven't done yet. We have done it. Well, you haven't? Yeah, not this year, but... We haven't done it this year. In the year that you did do it, you lost money. From where I'm sitting, I just don't see this as a business opportunity. So, for that reason, I'm out. Ticket sales for future events aren't enough to satisfy Peter Jones, who decamps from the deal. While a luxury-loving Tuka Suleiman has a confession to make. Guys, I've never been camping. Have you not? Never. No! Wow. So, the first thing that comes into my mind is, do I get a shower, bed, ensuite? What do you offer for the money that you're receiving? So with your ticket comes a, a space in our general camping, which is free. Right. Or we have other options. So there's a pre-pitched tent camping, which is a slightly more expensive on top of your ticket. We have holiday camping, which is vintage uh, frame tents. Yeah. Or there's boutique camping, which is the proper beds, the bell tent, you know, the whole shebang. So yeah. that's I easy. would have thought I'd rent one of these big vans, all luxury. Yeah, you yeah, You can yeah. do that as well. Oh, right. You could also hire somebody as well, too, to do the activities yeah. for you. <laughs> <laughs> so how many people do you have on each event? 2,000. It's not intimate. I can see myself coming down to your camp, one look and I'm out of there. <laughs> 2,000 people, that would drive me crazy. This is a business for somebody that knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. This is not a product where you ring up a, a retailer and say, we want to get your product in. It's very different. And for that reason, I'm out. Okay, thank you, Tika. Thank you. Lee, Julia, when I look at the concept that you presented today, it doesn't get me, like, tremendously excited. And I find that difficult as an investment because I wouldn't want to come. And I think you need an investor that would want to be there swinging on your zip lines and making your pots. Unfortunately, that's not me. 
And for that reason, I'm going to say that I'm out. I would swing on the zip wire and make the pots. <laughs> I just think he's a bit young. You're a bit young, so... Maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe. I love the concept. I love the business. I actually run probably the biggest craft retreat um, in the country, and it is hard work, really hard work. And 10 years we've slogged away at that and still haven't managed to, to make it make money. So I can't invest a day and I'm out. Sarah Davies knows all too well that the event business can be resource heavy, but profit light, and becomes the fourth dragon out. Deborah Meaden is the entrepreneur's last chance of investment, but also their favored dragon. Has she heard anything to elicit an offer? So guys, I really like it. Thank you. When I was in the holiday park industry, people coming in and providing a wow piece for my customers was absolute gold dust, you know. So I can clearly see what we could do with this. But there are some serious structural problems you've got ahead of you. And you need help. But I can offer help practically. I don't think I need to tell you because I think you know full well what my background is. Yes. So I'm going to make you an offer. I'm going to offer you all of the money, yep. and I want 25% of the business, which I think is a much more realistic valuation. Thank you. <laughs> Do you mind if we just have a couple of minutes to I'll discuss? I'm going to have a chat yep. behind Thank the you. trees. Yeah, exactly. In the woodland. Deborah Meaden thinks the festival idea has a real USP, and tables a bid. Oh, I've seen Deborah's amazing, but I just think that we don't give away too much now. What do you think? But in return for the £75,000 the duo is seeking, she wants five times more than the 5% of equity that they're willing to give away. What do you think is a decent number to go for? And it appears the pair have a new proposition to put to her. So, um, thank you very much for your offer. Um, we would like to ask if it would be possible to do 20%. And if we hit our numbers, which we believe we can, in the next season that we run, 315,000, would you be willing to roll back to the 5% that we pitched? 5%? No. That kind of misses the point, because if I'm having an impact on this business, then I'll be part of the you achieving your 315,000. I mean, it, yep, it, it's, illo it's completely illogical. So no is the answer. OK. Would you be willing to uh, do 20% for 75,000? Do you know, in your last counteroffer, I've got to tell you, I nearly fell off my chair. And that really worried me. I'm getting insights into how you are going to be when you go out there and you do business. And do you know what? I'm afraid I withdraw my offer. I'm out. OK. OK, thank you. All right, thank you for your time. Lee and Julia must leave the den with nothing. Well, as a disgruntled Deborah Meaden takes the highly unusual step of curtailing the negotiations. I'm shocked you did that, but I'm not surprised at all. It was completely wrong thinking. Mm. We had discussed in advance that the maximum we wanted to give away was 10%, so to have an offer like 25% just felt like too high an offer to me. Yeah. It is a good product. Obviously, you, you hope to go in and get five offers, but, I mean, it's a negotiation. Sometimes negotiations don't work out. Life's journey has brought me to this moment. I'll go in now. I'll put my best foot forward. I know I've got something good. I'm just going to see what the den, the universe, <laughs> presents to me. 
It's time to tame some dragons. Stuart's wife, Emily, has shared not just the flight from Down Under, but the long journey the invention has been on too. Come on, Stu. Can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> She'll be watching in our reaction room with family friend Giles. Ever since I've met Stu, he's always had ideas. Now it's like he's finally found, this is it, this is the one. And now to get the opportunity to be here is just brilliant. It could be a complete life changer. Hello, dragons. My name's Stuart Mason. I'm the inventor of Spartap. I'm here today with the opportunity of a £65,000 investment for a 20% equity share. The world is in the grip of a water crisis, and Spartap is a water-saving, eco-friendly, mobile tap and shower system that fits in your pocket. So it's made from silicone, and it instantly attaches to any bottle, creating a flow-controllable tap or shower that can dispense water in different ways. I'll just quickly demonstrate. So, if you wanted a small amount of water, say, for a hand wash, you can give it a gentle squeeze, and you get a little hand wash. If you wanted a bit more water, you can pull the bung out, and you get enough water for, say, a shower. This one-litre bottle will dispense water over 8 minutes and 30 seconds, which is extreme water saving. So in 18 months of trading, we have a turnover of £29,000. We have sold over 4,500 units. The UK retail price is £14.95. Our wholesale is between £4.50 and £8.50, depending on volume. Our landed cost is £3. In Europe, 33 million people go camping. And in the US, 45 million people per quarter go camping. Spartap has multiple applications within multiple markets, including the huge humanitarian market, and we recently won first prize in Standard Bank's Water for Africa competition, beating 470 other entrants from around the world and winning 10,000 US dollars. So, thank you. That's my pitch. Anyone is welcome to come up and have a closer look. Here we go. Good work. A pitch with green credentials from inventor Stuart Mason. He's hoping to secure £65,000 in exchange for 20% of his company. Just Let's give like it that. the gentlest of squeezes, that's it. And that gives you between 15 to 20 mil. Deborah Meaden made her first millions in British holiday parks. As a hand washing thing, that does actually work? does work. Think so, about it. If you just literally want to, just a. Just, oh. Well, you squeeze it with the very hand you. Yeah, you know. Oh, I see with the hand you. Yeah. That's, that's it. it. And now she's keen to ascertain whether there's a market for this product in her former sector. So in the UK, yep. um, how big is the camping market? Well, uh, uh, 5.4 million families will just go in tents. And what do they currently do for water? Depends. If you go to... People go wild camping, that means they'll take their own water in. But of the market, how many go wild camping and how many go on to camping sites that have got plenty of water access? Yeah, well, on camping sites, you know, probably... Maybe 60, 60% 60 will go to campsites where there is water. But if there is a shower block, if you want to wash your hands or just clean the food, you can take it over there or you can just have one of these hanging up and just, you know, you can have yeah, a quick rinse Yeah, to be fair, off. a lot of them have water and electrics close by anyway, don't they? So I'm just trying to understand the driver mm. behind why you would buy this in the camping fraternity when there is actually quite a lot of access to water on most sites, mm -hmm. unless they're completely wild. But I was hoping you might have an answer. Well... Go humanitarian, Stu. I've just mentioned the camping market, but there's sports, there's uh, handy men. Humanitarian? You know... Uh, but in what circumstances? I mean, you can't just list a group of people. In what circumstances and for what reason would they be using this? Well, I'll give you a perfect example of uh, dog people who are uh, walking the dog. Yeah, but go humanitarian. And they don't want their uh, car to get muddy after, like, muddy paws. So it's just... yeah. OK, no, you need to come up with... I, I don't want this to go wrong for you. OK. But you need to come up with something a lot stronger than that. 
It's, well, to keep clean, to clean children. But when? Well, when in their houses or in No, their... when, they're, when they're travelling, when they're out and about. It is like whenever you need a tap, Festivals? you can use this. Pardon? Festivals? Ab yeah, exactly. I'm glad you've reminded me of that. Oh, my God, yeah. You can get that for free. Thanks for that, Tika. Clutching at straws and having to be reminded of one of his product's key markets is not the best of starts for Stuart. But thankfully, another dragon is on hand to steer him towards that other major business opportunity, the charitable sector. I can totally see on the humanitarian side or, or in, 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 in the developing world, you could end up supplying probably quite a large number to water and sanitation projects around the place. Yes. Yes. Come on, Nick. If you're supplying, for example, to, um, uh, to, to, to development projects, do you have any idea of the, the price at which you could supply them? Because, you know, £4 in that, in that kind of environment, it's a lot of money. Yeah, we could probably get them down to, like, in US, one fifty, one. Uh, You're completely guessing, aren't you? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not completely guessing. Have you had a quote for any quantity that gets you down to a dollar fifty? I've had a quote that's got me down to uh, two, two dollar fifty on a hundred thousand. I think it's a precious building, don't you, Em? Yeah. I absolutely see how this would be a, an enormous amount of value by the side of a latrine, um, yes. where you, you've got What's a permanent what? latrine, it's an outdoor loo. But, but I just think you'd have to produce it at a price that was affordable in that market, which would mean your margin per item is, is, is tiny, uh, which would mean it's, you know, it's not going to be a huge uh, business. Nick Jenkins can see the potential, but not the profitability for the product's use in sanitation projects. Talk of which has given Peter Jones concerns of a rather unsavoury nature. Isn't, it, isn't this going to pass on potentially disease, though? I'm going to be touching this sort of teat at the end, or whatever you want to call it. I don't think that this is something people would want to share, is it? Thank you, Peter. You've hit the nail on the head. This is a personal tap. This is, there's no more sharing any more taps. Uh, 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 oh, no, but uh, in the uh, humanitarian, uh, uh, I mean, look, I mean, this, in, in, in a in in a development environment where it, you don't get one latrine per person, you get a lot of shared latrines. So someone has just come out of the loo, and they want to wash their hands. So they've put fecal material on the teat. How much of an issue is that? Well, when you're actually using one, if you have got unclean hands, you can actually very easily clean the whole unit because it's made of silicone. So the unit is very easy to keep clean. Yeah, I mean, I, I would need to be a little bit more convinced about that because I can't see people necessarily carrying this themselves to their latrine. I do see this thing hanging outside, in which case you're going to have to stop people actually, you know, touching it with the hands that they've just touched their bottom with. Nick Jenkins gets down to the nitty-gritty of some major concerns over cross-contamination. Can Sarah Willingham see beyond the issue to identify a lucrative opportunity? I think it's a really cool product, first of all. It clearly works. Thank yes. Thank you, Come Sarah. On. I could see, you know, last year at Glastonbury, I think there's quite a lot of us that would have, could have done with it. And, <laughs> you know, I, I can completely see the use of it in that type of environment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's there. Yeah. The challenge is, is in the consumer market, which is let's call it half of your goal is to get into the consumer market, the other half humanitarian. In the consumer market, I think it is so niche, which doesn't make it a massive business opportunity for the consumer side. So then I got very excited about the humanitarian side, very excited actually, until Peter dropped the sanitary, sanitary bomb. And I, I think that was absolutely bang on and I'd not thought of it. So I'm afraid I'm not gonna invest. I'm out. Thank you. That worry about hygiene just won't go away as Sarah Willingham becomes the first dragon to wash her hands of a deal. But Deborah Meaden is still reflecting on her old stomping ground, the holiday market. Sometimes you get products you would buy and you would use but you wouldn't invest in mm -hmm. uh, because it's just not big enough. 
The good news for you is actually it's quite a tight market, the camping market. You're going to know really, really quickly if you've got something. But I'm not convinced you have. I'm really sorry, Stuart. That's right. I kind of want to, uh, but I haven't found my reason, so I'm afraid I'm out. Thank you, what's name? Thank you. Oh, oh Deborah. Deborah Meaden pours cold water on the idea of a Meaden Mason partnership. And it looks like Peter Jones has made up his mind too. You would want this to be of a high volume product at a, low, at a low cost and everybody to use it. And unfortunately, I don't think that we're you, the communities of which you might want to go into with water aid um, and the like. I think that the cost will need to be a lot lower and then also you will have a cross-contamination issue because not everybody will be able to have their own individual one. So, sadly, I'm out, but good luck to you. Oh, he's nearly crying. He's nearly crying. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great idea. I mean, I like it and I'm thinking to myself, he's a nice guy. If I wanted to invest, how can I add value? And. And I think, I think what, what this needs is your perseverance. But I don't see this, for me, as being an investment where I'll get a return back on it. And for that reason, I'm not going to invest, and I'm out. Thank you, Taylor. Showered with compliments, but no cash, as Tuka Suleiman becomes the fourth dragon to bow out. Nick Jenkins is Stewart's last hope. Can details of that industry award persuade him into an investment? So this went to a panel who looked at it. Of expert judges. Of expert judges yeah. specifically looking at it as a water and sanitation product. Yeah, Water for Africa competition, we were first prize. This is good. Come on. We were actually mentioned in the HIF, the Humanitarian Innovation Fund report. Yeah. And it contrasts us with what else is on available within that market. There is, there's not a lot, things like a bucket. Um. Oh, look, I, I mean, I, I, I hope. I hope that, that, that you just carry on with that and, you, you, and, and, and actually it turns out that this ha doesn't have any cross-contamination issues. I just can't quite get past it. Um, but I'm afraid I, I, I can't invest. I wish you all the best and I'm out. Thank you. So that's it. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Stuart leaves the den with no cash, but it won't stop his steadfast determination to succeed. I'm not too embarrassed to say I've still never heard of a latrine before. Really? really? No. Here he comes. Here he comes. Oh. <laughs> Dragon <laughs> tape, Mum. <laughs> All right, we didn't get the investment, but I'll have the whole thing. Because <laughs> like, that 20%, that is going to be worth millions and millions and millions. I guarantee that.